Thank you, Simon. Ah, oh, cool. Good. So, for the new ones, I usually make the last slot of the day with something not so serious. So don't worry, that will be there also. <laughs> but sometimes I also do serious presentations. But it doesn't mean it has to be boring. Um, this is actually the worst slot, because that's the slot where everyone sleeps. It's after lunch, so I'll keep an eye on you. I'll write down who's sleeping. OK, so um, my name is Pascal Glor. Um, I've been working now for one and a half year um, for IN7. And I'm going to present how we life cycled our access. Um, so who is in it 7 For the one who don't know in it 7 uh, we are labeled the nerd ISP of uh, Switzerland. We have about 50 employees, and uh, our main product is called Fiber 7. Um, we have the principle of max, max, max fix, which is very important to us. Um, we don't distinguish bandwidth. We offer the service. It's the same price, no matter the bandwidth. We try to give you or our customers uh, the maximum bandwidth we can, depending on your physical possibilities, indeed. Um, so Fiber 7 began in 2014. Uh, it's basically renting Swisscom um, Allos, which are uh, access line optical, which is the last mile fiber uh, going to your uh, apartment or house. Um, so it was launched gigabit symmetrical for everyone. It is point to point. You have free router choice. You get a slash 48 v6, and you get a public v4. And um, yeah, and that was launched then. And then everyone said, "Wow, gigabit! That's so much. I mean, who's going to use that?" Yeah. So the infrastructure used at that time were Cisco 4500. This is a pop with two of them. And you see all the fibers on the left coming from the Swisscom side, where we connect uh, with bidirectional optics, uh, all the homes. And, and we can scale with different number of line cards. Um, they're usually built in a city from a core router going to one Swisscom location to another one, and then coming back to uh, another core router. And those rings were um, 10 gig. Um, exactly, as you can see here in the middle, the uh, supervisor card. So the breakout cables come from Swisscom. They're 24 fibers, so it's excellent to have 48 port line cards. So you can just plug two of them in the line cards. But um, well, that was seven years ago, and in all those years, the uh, market evolved, and they. Um, then in the years after we launched that, uh, came different deployment of uh, GPON um, and, and a few, but more like very few point-to-point -point gigabit, uh, mostly GPON, and I think it was 18, sold started with their uh, new offer with uh, 10 gig XGS PON, and then followed two years later with Swisscom and Sunrise also. So very creative there, just everyone doing the same. So for those who don't know what PON is, I've got a few slides for that, going quickly through. Uh, the main difference between point-to-point -point and PON is that in point-to-point, -point you have Ethernet over your fiber. So simply, it is from the switch of the ISP to your home, to your equipment, it's a dedicated fiber. With PON, you have a passive optical splitter so on the ISP side, you have the OLT, and on one port, you will be able to uh, then go a certain distance, then have a passive splitter, and then connect multiple fibers. Uh, but how many? So on PON, you have different standards. You've got uh, GPON, which is gigabit. Um, it, it is not gigabit, actually. I got the next slide with this piece. Um, so you got the different um, uh, XG PON, which is asymmetrical. XGS PON is symmetrical. Then you have 25 and 50 G PON, and and more coming. Uh, split ratio rarely small numbers. Very often 32, sometimes 64, um, 128, depending on technology, is possible. Um, 
don't, you don't have to forget that every time you split more, you have less signal. So less distance or more pow powerful laser is then uh, needed. Um, very often it's 32. Uh, which means that your bandwidth is going to be split uh, by 32. So it's, mm, let's say, similar to something you would see in DOCSIS, in cable uh, networks. So on the different PON technologies, you have like GPON, uh, 2.5 gig down, 125 up. This is indeed not the service you're going to deliver to the customer because that would just fill up the whole line. Um, XGPON, as I said, it's asymmetrical. XGSPON is symmetrical. Um, so if you connect 32 clients to XGSPON, you're maybe not supposed to give 10 gig to each customer, as some do. And then you got uh, 25 GPON, which is quite new, 50 GPON, I don't think there is a deployment yet, and there is also in standardization 100 GPON. Um, again, on, for example, on 25 GPON, it is not the idea that you have 25 gig. You will have maybe 10 gig, and you will be split, the 25 gig are going to split up with, with like 31 other customers. Um, so as I said. So how does it look regarding the oversubscribing? So um, I, I, we are physically in Swisscom location, and indeed we have um, eyesight access to uh, other installations, which means that I was able to see how other ISP do their stuff. And some unnamed provider, which I will definitely not name, um, that, that's their typical setup. So they have a 32 splitter, so the 10 gig XGS pond is split on 32 customers. Then you have a card in the OLT, which is basically the, so the, the, the switch they have, uh, and it's 16 port per line card, and the chassis can hold 12 line cards. And usually they're gonna have one to four chassis per location, and then you look at all these chassis and you look at the uplinks and they go to two routers and they're in some kind of ring or maybe going to the core somewhere. And the uplink are 10 gig. <laughs> Perfect. So this is my estimation of the oversubscribing, which is about 25,000 times. Um, okay, so after not so much talking, we decided not to do that. <laughs> Pretty kick. So I was looking when I started in, in April last year uh, at Init7, I was looking at the access layer and was thinking it's becoming quite old, the hardware starts to fail, and we need to do something. So if we're going to life cycle this, it's time to do something else. Well, what do we do? What do we want to do different? So indeed, we want to do. 10 gig, and not XGS PON, we want to do point to point 10 gig, uh, same as we did seven years ago with one gig, we want to just do uh, 10 gig, and the other problem is we need to life cycle the platform, we're going to not just buy new ones of this old, we want something new, we also want to do uh, um, new services, um, so we want to have one rack unit um, chassis, so in smaller pop, because with the four and a half thousand, we always have big chassis. They also use a lot of power, even if we have only one line card in it. So we wanted to have like um, single rack unit chassis. Uh, we wanted 10 G ports, uh, 40 or 100 gig uplinks, uh, and we wanted chassis having 24 or 48 ports or 96. Just a multiple of 24 because that's that's the uh, the cables that come from Swisscom. And we also wanted something a bit more modern that we can offer like MPLS for business services. Exactly, one box to rule them all. We didn't want to have different kind of devices like a pop router and then like switches or something. We would just have one box that have all the capabilities. So we started and we, we looked at different vendors. We talked to them and, and looked at the designs we did and, and yeah, we exchanged. And, and at some point we realized that well, almost all of, all of these vendors offered us switches with SFP28 ports. And then we 
were thinking, well, that's a crazy idea. We could do 25 gig, actually. And I was just looking at uh, our orange friends, if they have optics doing that. <laughs> and they do. There is a bidirectional uh, 25 gig optic, 10 kilometers, exactly what we need. But is it affordable? Yeah, it is. It is affordable. It is more expensive indeed, but it is affordable. Even a, a good nerd would be able to invest in that. <laughs> so, yep, let's do 25 gig. We just had no idea what we were doing indeed. So we're just like, okay, let's do that. So we um, took our decision of our um, uh, vendor. So this is the uh, hardware we're currently building it. Um, so the first RC has 20, uh, 48 port. Also, uh, an important factor was no licensing for 10 to 25 gig. Huh? <laughs> that kicked some vendors out. Um, this chassis is actually cool. It's an enterprise chassis, so it has no license for anything. It just works. And it's from Cisco. That's incredible. No licensing. <laughs> <coughs> It's not the same <laughs> if you go and service provider class device. <laughs> <laughs> you can sell you some smart net stuff. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. indeed. <laughs> so it has 48 ports SFP28. It has four uh, QSFP28. Uh, um, and the problem is we didn't want to like, some pops, we have a lot of them, like 20. And, and we didn't want to make like a, a ring uh, to connect them together. We wanted really a start topology in the in the pops. Um, so the problem is you don't have enough interfaces uh, to connect all the switches. If you have like 10 or so, you, you can't connect them together. So this is why we also have this for the larger pops. For the smaller pops, we use uh, only the small chassis, the, the, the one on top with the customer connections. And for the larger pop, we also use the 30C, 32C, which has only QSFP28 to aggregate all the switches together. And um, we wanted this to be a bit of a surprise. Um, maybe Freddie remembered me the date. It was in April or the, the, the seven year anniversary of the launch of Fiber 7. It was, it was all a bit um, uh, luck, but, but the date was coming uh, and he said, we need we need that on that date. Okay. So we start, we said, okay, let's, let's do one city. Let's do Winterthur, because that's where we are. So let's do Winterthur, and we start with silent rollout. We just announced, we announced, you know, maintenance work, <laughs> six, seven hours, whole night through, because there are big locations, a lot of fiber, and you have to replug every module in the new switches. Luckily, we're going to Cisco, from Cisco to Cisco, so we at least didn't have to reprogram every optic. <laughs> so, we got some hardware. I started configuring some stuff. Um, then I broke my finger. <laughs> Doesn't matter, we continued. <laughs> So um, then we, you have a lot of garbage. <laughs> There's so much trash to throw away. This is crazy. Um, then my hand got better. <laughs> then we started silently rolling out the new switches without telling anyone. This is like, I don't remember, like 20 terminals open trying to configure during the migration. I was more like the... Uh, the guy configuring the switch and, and, and some of our guys were in the pop, like replugging all the things. This is the first pop we did. It's actually, Freddy said, well, the first pop, it's going to be the pop you are connected to because I'm sure it's going to work then. <laughs> so I had to do the migration over 4G. <laughs> so that's the first pop we did. That's Oberwinterthur. Okay. So nobody knew about anything. So then came the announcement. Freddie did some kind of Easter egg tweeting saying, yeah, happy birthday, Fiber 7. Seven years ago, um, 
uh, we started Gigabit, so what is it going to be, <laughs> you know? And um, there was a hint in the middle about Moore's law. And indeed, someone quickly found out <laughs> that if you apply Moore's law on 18 months, you got exactly 25 gig. <laughs> That's all luck, <laughs> really, but it's fun. So we announced that. And uh, we did some uh, advertising in Winterthur with the 25G. But meanwhile, some people still thought they were the fastest with their XGS pawn. Um, and the funny story, I mean, there is so much thing that happened that wasn't planned. Nokia published the same day that they're going to do 25 gig with Proximus. I don't remember, it's Belgium, I think. Um, but that, that's 25G PON. So they're basically going to offer 10 gig to the customer, and, but that's nowhere in the article, indeed. Uh, the CP don't do 25G on the LAN side, they do 10 gig, and it's divided by 32. But again, it was again an ISP who was the fastest somehow. So, conclusion. Um, I stole that slide from Michelle. Where is, who is Michelle? Somewhere there. Oh, yeah. You remember that slide? <laughs> so, good news. <laughs> we solved the bandwidth problem. Well, almost. <laughs> Challenges. Yeah. Well, the first challenge was the speed test server. <laughs> if you're going to offer 25G, well, then you have to, do, to have a speed test server that works, at least 25G. So we actually put a QSF, QSFP28 uh, card, PCI card in the server and just connected that server directly in the core. And it does do 25G. It does about 40, 50. So, OK. Payable CP, that's still, oh, three minutes, OK. Payable CP, that's still a bit of a challenge. Um, 10G is quite common. You can find hardware. The LAN side is copper. It's quite easy. You, you find your stuff. 25G is more complicated. Many of our customers who do 25G, wanted 25G, they, they buy a PCI card and just put it in their server. Um, that is a good way of making it work. Um, production bottleneck, uh, well, we're just hitting the next one. Six months delivery from Cisco, uh, but we have still a lot of switches. Um, other challenges, we need to accelerate the rollout. Um, so we started involving non-tech employees because like replugging SFP doesn't need a lot of training. It's like like three minutes explaining to them and, and then we can just like um, get more resources from other teams. Um, even, even from the management, the last migration this week were done by three people from management, from the board. So, I was not the board. And he was not. That's true. We did burn together. <laughs> um, yeah, involve customers. Free labor. Where is Pim? <laughs> Pim, <laughs> Pim migrated his own pop. Uh, <laughs> and he, he upgraded his link to 10 gigs himself. And we got, I think, four volunteers for Geneva already. So that is cool. Uh, automate your migration process. The more you have scripts and doing, like, like, you know, collecting data from the old switch and building the configuration of new, you're going to save a lot of time. Uh, delegate stuff to non-tech people if you can. Um, I have built this small website for zero-touch provisioning of the switches. You basically have a barcode scanner. You can scan the switch. It fills up the MAC address. You just type the host name. It will go to the, down to the list. You drag and drop the config in the things there, and it will associate the config. And then you just plug, power the switch, plug it in some LAN, and it just happens. It will upgrade, and you will deploy the configuration, which means that once you have done that, anyone can do it in the company. You don't need an engineer. Questions? Am I on time? I'm over time. I'm time over on overtime. I'm perfect, actually. Here it's 1948. Huh? <laughs> Any questions? questions? No, I have one. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, what is your um, uplink utilization? You talked about oversubscription and then... Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. do you know... So, so as I can give you an example. Um, the ring in Winterthur has um, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, customers on it. It is four locations, and when we had gigabits to the customer, we had a 10 gig ring, and the load was maybe five, six gig. The load moving to 10G and 25G, well, it doesn't really change. <laughs> so we have a 100 gig ring now, but the load is still five, six gigabit. Sometimes we have peaks, indeed, people doing speed tests. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and honestly, my 25 gig, I, I've, I've tried everything. I have tried, um, I'm running a Tor exit node. <laughs> it, it's 400 meg. There's nothing there. Uh, I've tried downloading every possible torrent. Nope. The only thing that fills my link is really speed test. But again, seven years ago, it wasn't really different for, for one gig. And so we're going to have this infrastructure for a while, and 10 gig and 25 gig will probably be used in five, six years. We'll have some service that will fill that up. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see future will tell us. Yes? Um, one sec. Um, how many configuration errors did you run to through the migration? <laughs> how many configuration errors? errors? You mean, sorry? How many configuration errors have you encountered during the migration? Because are you not yeah, something yeah. that you took get, all configuration it. and get to new configuration it's, somehow? It's not always easy. Um, you change completely to this one switch to another one. Even if it's Cisco, it's still not the same. It will behave differently. Uh, there is like um, FEC um, forward error correction, which behaves differently. And we had business customers going down because there was some incompatibility with the FEC. Um, sometimes you have um, fibers that have been wrongly patched. Um, so when, when we order a, a client, we tell them we want on that cable that fiber, so we know on which port the customer should land, and well, sometimes it's not there, or there was some change and our documentation was not updated for some reason, and when we redeploy, we deploy like with the knowledge we have, and then sometimes it happens that the customer goes down and so on, we then try to fix it as soon as possible indeed. But it does happen. And also, we had to engineer the whole configuration and, and then like write script that took the old configuration and like migrated to the new one. And it's, it's not without failure, indeed. <laughs> yeah, multicast. We had, uh, we had issues. We, uh, we had to engineer a long time to avoid customer uh, becoming, um, what is it called again? Ugh. Thomas? Querier. Customer became Querier, which just broke the whole multicast in the whole LAN. <laughs> exactly. Fix that. <laughs> yes? Hi, I am Marco. Um, about IPv4. You say that uh, you deliver a single IPv4 to each customer's public, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you have a lot of IPv4 in the bank. Mm. No. No. But and on the Fiber future? 7, you will always get one public v4. That is the service we want to deliver. That is also why we deliver uh, slash 48, another slash 56 in v6 because we just believe in that stuff i think you should have access to a public v4 and even if you want more you can actually buy more if you want a subnet that's even possible um but yeah that's going to stay like that yeah <laughs> okay you're asking uh, your employee ne never never take yeah. your boss to presentations uh, he he did great <laughs> Be great. I'm proud. <laughs> no, actually, um, we never will sell a product without fiber, uh, without IPv4 for every customer. So some stuff like carrier grade net, unless we declare it. So 
we of course think also about aggregating. Uh, every ISP has to do that these days, and uh, there might be some product which then declares that there is no uh, IPv4 address, like the others which don't declare it. Yep. If there is one, there will be like two products. Questions? Okay. Then yeah, I, have, I have one question. No, you have. No, I have one question. <laughs> it's 10 seconds, not even. Who's customer? Oh, shit. <laughs> you I heard, heard that, Freddy. I heard that. Thank you. You can directly go to Sandra. She is doing all the. Okay. Do you want to be. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>